ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله all praises are due to Allah we thank him and we seek his forgiveness we seek refuge in Allah from the evil of our own souls and the evil of our own deeds whomever Allah guides no one can lead him astray and whomever Allah leads astray no one can guide him I bear witness that there is no deity worthy of being worshipped other than Allah. He is alone and he has no partners. And I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was his last messenger and servant. Uh, my brothers and sisters in Islam, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward all of uh, you today for coming out to listen to our story. And bless, uh, Allah bless uh, this uh, community with success in this life and the next. Ameen. Uh, <clears throat> our story is uh, not, uh, you might have heard many people talk about their coming to Islam. Uh, ours is nothing, you know, anything uh, uh, say exciting to talk about. We just want to, you know, pass on a little bit of what we experienced throughout our research in trying to find the truth. Um, my, my, me, myself, I was born in uh, New York in 1977. And I lived in New York for approximately 11 years. And throughout that time, uh, I lived with my parents, alhamdulillah. Uh, they, came, they migrated from El Salvador in 1969. Uh, they came, like many of uh, our, the parents here today, who came to this country to try to find a better life, to try to you know, improve the, the lifestyle of their family. Uh, alhamdulillah, uh, my parents were very spiritual, especially my mother. Uh, she was the one who always encouraged me and my two sisters to go to church. And I remember going to church uh, you know, every Sunday up to the point I was seven years old. Uh, I became the altar boy. The altar boy is the one who carries the cross for the priest in the beginning of the procession and assists him uh, during the, uh, the service. And this is something that uh, I was very active in, uh, going to Catholic school. Uh, my parents put me in Catholic school to keep me out of trouble, keep me away from uh, the streets out there in New York, trying to, you know, to make uh, their son you know, someone who's res respectable and you know, not have him to be down with the hoodlums as, as they would have said it back in those days. Um, well, alhamdulillah, during that time, uh, my father, he felt the need to come back to New York after paying a thousand dollars a month in rent. And then he compared it to Houston, Texas, he could get a three bedroom apartment for 400. He saw the finances was you know, intelligent today. Let's go down to Houston because it's cheaper to live. And it seems like it's better also in, uh, uh, in general, just a general environment is better for, for the children. So my parents moved down to Houston, Texas uh, when I was 11 years old. When I came down to Houston, it was a different makeup. That started to affect my mentality. In New York, you know, when you have friends, you have friends of African American, Hispanic, white, mixed together. But I've sensed a different kind of mentality in Houston. That it was African Americans by themselves, white people with themselves, and Hispanics with themselves. It was really segregated. So a lot of times, when people ask me, where are you from? Um, you know, and, and come at me really rough, like I'm from New York. And they'd be like, ah, oh, okay. What that meant was that they, they knew that I wasn't going to be uh, like them, meaning I wasn't going to just stick around with one group of people. I was going to mix with the different people in the school. I remember, though, always being asked, you know, I man, why are you hanging out with you know this white guy? Why are you always hanging out with this black guy? You stick with your own. I was like, my, our own. I mean, our own is everybody. I mean, I'm down with everybody. So this was the mentality of the people in the community that I lived. Uh, both of us we grew up in and this is when gangs started to come about in uh, the early 90s in, in Houston so alhamdulillah by Allah's permission during that time period I went into you know my sports was into football and I kept out of any you know the gangs and alhamdulillah Allah saved me from that but at the same time I remember that our own little football team was our own crew because we stuck together and after a period of time, I started to ask myself, you know, my faith. I was having issues with my faith. I remember looking back at it, as 13 years old, asking myself, 
I'm not satisfied with what I was going to church in. I wasn't satisfied living that, you know, going to church. It didn't make sense to me. And at the same time, dealing with the environment that I was dealing with, I started to ask myself, is this the truth? Is Christianity the truth? And I stopped going to church. And during that period, I started reading and I came across uh, books on Islam. And I remember meeting the first Muslim, I remember. He was a friend of mine, he became Muslim at 13 years old. And I remember asking him, you know, why are you changing your religion at 13? He said, I believe it's the truth. And we would see him, I remember around Asr time, when, you know, late in the afternoon, when we were playing football, playing basketball. You know, he was like, I have to go pray. And for us, to see a 13-year-old kid from where we grew up, go pray. We were like, pray. And we would, we would you know, we would, I was a street lingo, we would clown him. You know, we will make fun of him. Like, how are you going to go pray? It's time to have fun. It's time to pray. But alhamdulillah, he stuck it through. So when I started to research what he was believing in, I said to myself, this might be the truth. And subhanAllah, that summer before my ninth grade year, I went to New York. And me being 14 years old, by myself, getting sent to my favorite uncle and auntie who would let me do whatever I wanted in Flushing, Queens, New York with all my old friends who are older than me. It was, for me, it was my time of my life. I was going to be free. And I remember going there, and subhanAllah, walking in the streets of New York City, and seeing people coming through, saying, well, you know, what's going on, what's up, what's, you know, and people giving salams to each other. And I asked my friend, you Muslim? He's like, nah, that's how we talk here in New York, because it was an in thing to do. In New York, that's how people say, give salams to each other. You know, they'll say certain words like, what's up, ak, you know, ahi. That's how non-Muslims even speak. So I remember asking him, so if you're not Muslim, you know, wh why did you give him salam? They said, no, nah, Islam is an interesting faith. You should read the book of, of Malcolm X. So I remember reading the autobiography of Malcolm X during that time period. And I said to myself, without a doubt, this is the truth. And but the only way I can become Muslim is I have to be like Malcolm X. So at 14 years old, I'm not going to give up all this partying. I'm not going to give up all this fun to be like Malcolm X. It's too much. This was my understanding of being a Muslim. You have to be straight, 100%. It's black and white. But subhanAllah, Allah didn't got me at that moment. And I had to go through serious issues throughout my teenage life in order for me to see that I needed Islam. Because when I was 14 years old, 15 years old, going to New York, coming back to Houston, and I remember the environment that we were dealing with, the movies that were coming out at the time, movies that were called Boys in the Hood, New Jack City, Menace to Society, this affected the way that we were thinking, plus the music that we were listening to. It's something for many of the youth today, a lot of the young brothers and sisters here, who may hear it. But we actually lived it. Because we could relate to what they were talking about. We could relate to sitting around with our friends, and all of a sudden one of our friends just start beating on somebody for no reason. And laughing about it. We, can be, we were in cars where somebody would just get out the car and mug somebody for no reason. This was the darkness that we were living in. We had no guidance. But we felt being together was a sense of brotherhood. But we were living this. We would wake up in the morning listening to the hip hop, to the rap. And it would bring us in a certain mode. If I feel like I want to be a tough mode, I would listen to a certain you know, artist. If I'm going to be in a relaxed mode, I would listen to something else. I want to put in my car with my Buick Regal dropped with my 15 woofers driving to my school and I wanna, what, what, what mood I wanna be in today, I'll put in that CD or that, well we didn't have CDs back then, tapes. And I go, oh man, SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah, I can't believe it. Thinking about, now we're saying that we're old. But a lot of the things that we were doing, I, we still see people doing today. And a lot of our friends, they never le left that lifestyle. So, going through high school, 
doing so much, you know, bad to myself, evil to myself, evil to others, not respecting my parents, not respecting my elders. After going through that lifestyle, I remember being 19 years old. Clearly, it was clear. And I was at a party. And it was the day that a American terrorist, homegrown, he bombed, the, uh, he, he had a bomb in the, uh, the Atlanta, uh, Atlanta Olympics in 1996. Never forget it. Everybody was partying, I was just sitting there watching TV. And I remember seeing the chaos that was going on on television. And then I was looking around my, in my environment. And I remember the last time I ever touched alcohol, alhamdulillah. And I put it down and I said, here's everybody's having fun, having a good time, careless. People here are going crazy. They're, you know, they're falling on, you know, on top of each other, panicking. And I asked myself, is this what it's all about? Is this, is this what my life is about? Is there something more than this? It can't be just this. Either I'm going to go deeper into darkness, the women are going to get older, the drugs are going to get harder. You know, the lifestyle is just going to lead me to something that is not pleasing to my parents, not pleasing to myself. I was really talking to myself that night. And I said to myself, I, got, I have to make a change. Because after going through all the things that I went through, brothers and sisters, and not trying to glorify it, what we did. We did a lot of bad stuff to people and to ourselves. I mean, really bad. I mean, we used to plot on doing evil things. And after a while, you start asking yourself, Man, I, can't, I can't be like this. So alhamdulillah, this was in July of 1996, when I started to ask myself, I need to leave this alone. And I need to step away from everybody. All my old friends, I have to leave them. So alhamdulillah, when I was looking into Islam, I said, I'm going to go back to that religion. I know that's going to rectify me. Started reading a little bit more about it. But I still, I remember driving around the city looking for a mosque. and It wasn't Allah's will to find it at that time. I was driving around. I remember there was one Dawah center that it was never open. Always knocking on it, but always looking. I was searching at that time. And I remember working at a, uh, in a video store and there was a friend of mine, or there was a friend, there was a guy who came in the store with his nephew. And my birth name is Christian. That's what my parents named me. The Christian that became Muslim. And that's what my mom and sister always say. Um, so there, uh, he looked at my, at my name tag, he was like, Christian. So I'm looking at him with a real mean look. Like, what's God calling my name? That's a good Christian name. So I'm looking at him like, okay. And I'm, and I'm looking at him, he looks kind of Greek, kind of European. Maybe this guy's Christian, he wants to call me to, his, to Christianity. And I'm not, I already knew that that wasn't the truth. So he goes, what religion do you follow? So I really started getting upset. I didn't want to even look at him. I was just trying to, you know, uh, you know check him out and get him out of there. I didn't want to deal with that. I said, my parents are Catholic. He said, but what religion are you? And I don't know why I said it, but I felt maybe it was because I wanted to debate somebody. I said, I want to be a Muslim. He looked at me crazy. His eyes were bulging. He looked back at his nephew and they were saying something in a, a language I didn't understand at the time. Of course, it was Arabic. They were saying, subhanAllah, subhanAllah. They're like, we're Muslim. So I'm sitting there like, okay. It's like, what do you know about Islam? And I'm like, I just read about Malcolm X. So they were just in shock because they had just started practicing their deen. And at the time, I remember talking to him little by little during the, that time period. We realized that we, were, we lived in the same neighborhood in, in, uh, in New York. We went to the same high school in Texas, but we never met each other. But we had, we had acquaintances. And subhanAllah, that day Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, wrote it for us to meet. And the thing that always affected me, inshallah, that we'll speak about a little bit more tomorrow, from the brother, and he was young. I was 19, he was 20. He would come to my job to see how I was doing. That's, he would only come to see how, he wasn't trying to preach to me. 
He would just come to see how my day was going. So us coming from the streets, usually when someone is coming after once or twice, they want something. We become suspicious. Like, what does this guy want from me? Why is he coming to visit me? Because this is not something that we do. So one day, I said to him, look, you know, it seems like you're interested in about telling me about Islam, so let's go sit down. And I remember I had a close friend of mine, who's the, one of the older brothers, the older friends that I used to have back in Jahiliya. I said, look, I know that we talked about Islam, let's go together and talk, talk to him about, you know, our, our, you know, our uh, interest in Islam. And Alhamdulillah, that brother was really nice. He would take us to different masajid. We would talk to different elders of the community. And then I'll never forget it. One day he calls up, October 13th, 1996. He says, it's Isha time. Right after, around Maghrib time, he calls. He said, look, I think that you guys are ready. I said, I don't know. I still want to read up a little bit. He goes, look, man, you believe Allah is one? Yes. Muhammad, saw, Muhammad, peace be upon him, that's what he said, was the last messenger? Yes. Then that's it. Come on. I'll take both of you to the mosque. So, so you know, he picked us up. We went to a big white mosque called Madrasa Islamiyah in Houston, Texas. And we come in the mosque and there's over 200 Indonesian and Malaysian and Indian brothers of Anjama Tabli. So all these men with turbans on, big beards, and we're sitting there coming with our earrings, with our pants sagging. We're like, man, they're going to just look at us crazy. So we go there, and uh, it's time to pray. Uh, okay, we just go along, we pray Isha with him. Then the brother, his name was Aman Allah, he tells us, go sit in the back of the mosque. So we're looking at each other like, we don't even know how to become Muslim. We're like, are they going to ask us questions? So we're like, uh, what, what are the five pillars? Because it's something Hajj and fasting and this the thing that we pay money. Yes, prayer. And we were just trying to figure it out because we, we didn't know what was going to happen. Then all of a sudden, 200 plus men come sit around us. And we're looking like, my God, this is just weird. Just looking at all these men with big beards just staring at us. Like, what are you going to do? You know, well, alhamdulillah, the Imam Hafiz Iqbal, mashallah, you know, beautiful brother, Imam, he sits down in front of us and he, you know, asks his basic questions and do you believe in, in Allah is, you know, is the only God and that the Prophet is the last messenger? We say yes. Alhamdulillah, we took the shahada and then he asked us, well, do you want to take a name? You know, a Muslim name. And I said, you know, actually I want to. My mother named me Christian after Jesus Christ. So I want to call, you know, I want to be called Isa. And then they looked to my, my, my man, my friend, Terrence, and they said, what about you? And he was like, you know, people say that I'm a handsome guy, so I want to name myself Yusuf. You know, mashallah. So, and I remember after that standing up, hugging over 200 men, men crying. We, it was just different for us. And I remember this young kid jumping up and down. Hey, you have to take this earring out. You have to take this earring out. And I mean, my man, Aman Allah, was like pushing him out the way. And we're coming out the masjid and it was just like a whole different world. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fulfilled filled that, that void that I was having for all this time. And alhamdulillah, by Allah's permission, uh, you know, I got married eight months later to a sister who accepted Islam in the high school that I graduated in. Alhamdulillah, in uh, Houston, we have over, I think, 40 MSAs, high schools that have Juma uh, in, in Houston, Texas. And the high school that I graduated from was the second one, second MSA in 1996, and she accepted Islam there. So I married her, and alhamdulillah, um, after that, my father accepted Islam, my sister accepted Islam, um, my cousin accepted Islam, and alhamdulillah, friends that we knew, my best friend, you know, he accepted Islam. After he saw me, he was like, yo, man, I got this new pager, and I, this, we had pages back in those days, you know, and I got this new CD, and he would come at me and like, so we're going to go out tonight? And I grew up with him, and I was like, nah, man, I don't do that no more. He was like, what's up with you? And I was wilder than him. I said, look, man, I'm Muslim now, man. And he was just looking at me, and he just got scared. He wouldn't talk to me for about two months because he couldn't believe from a few months ago, you know, I was wilder than him doing crazy stuff. And all of a sudden, by Allah's permission, it's all from Allah, it went cold turkey on everything. Never, I just forgot everything. Didn't have any uh, want to go back to that lifestyle. So, alhamdulillah, uh, after, you know, uh, talking to other people, alhamdulillah, he accepted Islam, and from there, alhamdulillah, brothers, by Allah's permission, I had the opportunity uh, to go study in the Islamic University of Medina, uh, and uh, it was a beautiful experience taking my wife and children over there as well, 
meeting people from all over the world. Uh, I gained a lot of experience. Uh, I uh, met many beautiful brothers. Uh, like when I see uh, the brother Muhammad here and I look at him, I, really I tear up because I love his brother for Allah's sake. That brother, Ahmed Kurdi and Ahmed Bilal, mashallah, those are the two brothers that I love so much because uh, when I look at them, I have, uh, I make dua that my children, and my, especially my son, can be like them. You know, I know they have their faults, and especially Ahmed, if he hears it, probably watching this video, he's probably going to be, you know, oh my God. No, I, you know, he knows how I am, but the, the, manners, the manners that those brothers have is beautiful. And, um, and, I, and one of the reasons I came here is because I wanted to uh, really inform or and encourage you brothers and sisters to make dua for them and to be there for them and mentor them. Because uh, there are not many brothers who come from uh, Medina and or wherever, Egypt, or studying overseas to come back to a community that wants good for them and wants to, they, they want to help the community and they also are open to suggestions and mentorship. They're open to that. And alhamdulillah, building that kind of relation with the brothers over there was a beautiful experience. And uh, alhamdulillah, coming back here to America six months ago, um, uh, I started, you know, as Mujahid always picks on me, everybody's going 70, I'm going 20, maybe I'm going 30 now miles per hour, I'm trying to pick up the pace. I make, please make dua for me and, and trying to improve in that situation. And uh, Alhamdulillah, now I'm the director of uh, social and educational uh, services for Islam in Spanish. And uh, hopefully uh, Allah opens the door soon that I can begin my master's in, uh, in counseling uh, to better myself and hopefully, you know, be an asset to the community. And so this was my short story on becoming a Muslim and what the thought processes and what I went through. Not too much detail because uh, I can't talk about certain things in the masjid. But uh, alhamdulillah. Uh, May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you all and bless you all. Amen. Subhanak Allah wa bihamdik. Wa ashadu an la ilaha illa anta wa staghfiruka wa tubi ilayhi. Bismillah. Bismillah. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Amma ba'd. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alhamdulillah. Wa alhamdulillah. It's really an honor to be able to spend, wa alhamdulillah, this weekend. Uh, here in California with uh, such a beautiful community. Alhamdulillah, I've been able to um, perceive a little bit of what was taking place here in Southern California and Alhamdulillah, I really, um, uh, it's commendable, I would say, because going back to Houston, we have uh, tried uh, our level best to be able to, inshallah, implement some of the things that Alhamdulillah we're seeing that are happening here. And inshallah, may Allah bless you all, inshallah, I give you all success in this life and the next. Um, my name is Mujahid Fletcher, and I'm originally from Colombia and South America. My parents came to this country when I was eight years old. My father was an agricultural engineer back in Colombia. He worked with an agency that was connected to the government of Colombia in regards to development of agriculture. He taught people who were illiterate in the mountains on how to plant crops and so on. And he taught people at university level. My mother, she came from, a, alhamdulillah, a good family. My grandfather was uh, in, in a very uh, honorable level, I would say, in, in, in regards to having a governmental job. And when we came, here to America, I remember going to the very first school when I was eight years old. I didn't know any English, and I remember the kids were making fun of me. And I realized and I saw that a lot of what I experienced in Colombia, going to school, was the fact that over there we helped each other out, even in second grade, because I came here to go in third grade. If I didn't know something, the person next to me didn't know something. Before going to the teacher, you would actually work it out on your own amongst your classmates. And I remember coming here and I didn't even know English and I would try to ask people around me and I didn't know who could explain to me. And I remember the teacher coming and, and just being upset and saying a whole bunch of things. So they put a kid that knew Spanish in front of me and, and he translated for her and he said, uh, she said not to talk to anybody except her. And uh, if you need help, just go to her. And she didn't know any Spanish. And so I 
told them. I said, I don't, I don't, I can't talk to her. And she said, well, you know, don't talk. That was my first experience in, in school, in third grade. I remember going home and um, now I would categorize that as a culture shock. I went home and I told my parents I never wanted to go back to school. Here, I was eight years old. And uh, my parents, from that point on, didn't really know the reality of that situation in the years to come. And I mentioned that because the rest of the years, as time went by, and I did learn English, not only did I learn English, but I learned the ways and I learned the environment. And in public school growing up, you kind of become a chameleon, you know, you blend in eventually. And then you realize what's categorized as good and you want to be better at that. And from my parents' background in Colombia, they always had a high standard for education. And they always pushed me to many things that I didn't see in the environment going to school here in public school. When I was in sixth grade, three movies came out, as the brother mentioned, same movies. Actually, Boys in the Hood was filmed here in, in Compton, Los Angeles. New Jack City was filmed in New York. And I believe Minister Society was also filmed here in California. These three movies portray the gang lifestyle. And we never seen anything to do with gangs in our school until these movies came out and the music that came along with it. So I remember the majority of the people in our school were either African American or Latino. And I remember one day seeing the, the African Americans gathering and I began to realize that the Latinos, as we would say back in those days, were getting jumped. Meaning an individual would go in the restroom and five African Americans would just beat them up for nothing. And we realized then that they had formed a gang. And we didn't really understand what that was. Growing up, my father taught me how to box and taught me self-defense. And he taught me to respect people. And he taught me sports, soccer, and so on. And I knew there was, not, there, there was not even a chance in my mind that someone would come and violate me because of being brown or because I was Latino. So I thought it wouldn't even affect me. Little did I know the same apartment complex I used to live in and walk to school from back and forth. The gang was in my apartment complex. So eventually they got closer to violating me as an individual. And when that took place, I basically defended myself and, and pretty much beat up one of the main guys <laughs> in that gang. Well, this led on a lot of retaliation. So a lot of people came. And since there were a lot of Latinos, they kind of came behind me. And all of a sudden, the Latinos said, you know, we have to come together, you know, for self-defense. And because we were from Latin America, Central America, from so many different places, you know, from Colombia, Venezuela, uh, Costa Rica, Guatemala, so many different places. We titled that gathering and us coming together as La Familia, meaning the family. What went on after that was a series of events that led to people dying. People ended up in prison and there were serious issues. The police got involved, there were profiles, and I might, there, there, is, there was no intention whatsoever for any of that to happen, for myself or for many of us. But that was just the climate that we were living in. When my parents found certain things at home, when I was about the age of 13 to 14, I told them that if I didn't have those things there, we wouldn't be protected. If someone came and tried to break in the house or tried to do anything to me or to them, and they couldn't understand. The repetitive cycle of my parents not understanding led me to make decisions at a very early age that were critical to survival. It wasn't a game, it wasn't a game, it wasn't about showing off, it wasn't about being cool, it was about not dying. One of my friends was so under pressure, one of my best friends, that he pulled the gun, put a gun to his head and he shot. He was, he'd rather die than be living in that state. 
because you never really knew who would come behind you, what would happen. And the worst thing about it even, is that he didn't die. The bullet came in through one side, left out the other, and they had to cut out part of his brain. So he became like a vegetable. So at around the age of 14, 15, I was going and visiting hospitals and seeing people, another friend of mine lost his right eye from a shotgun blast from a, a drive-by shooting. And all my parents thought about is when is my son going to be next? People used to call my mother at 3 in the morning telling her that they were going to kill me. And all of these things were happening and I don't understand how to this day. I was an honor roll student. I had straight A's and B's while all that was happening. Because of my father's determination, my mother's determination for me to uphold the best level of grades. Eventually at the age of 16 when there was an attempt after several attempts basically to take my life, I basically defended myself and by the next day, my parents shipped me out to Colombia, to South America. I hadn't been there since I was eight. All of a sudden, when I went down there, I thought, you know, if I didn't get killed back in Houston, I'm going to die in Colombia. Because Colombia, the way it's portrayed in the media, it seems like a very dangerous place. Right? Drugs and many things. And to my surprise, when I went there, I had baggy pants and the whole mental attitude of, you know, who's out to get me and a lot of psychological ways of looking at life from a defense mechanism. When I went there and I saw my family that I didn't really know since the age of eight, I started realizing that these people were the best mannered people, the the, the, the nicest, the most caring that, that I'd been around. I mean, my parents were that way, but it was just father and mother. I didn't really have aunts and uncles. When I went to the house where I stayed, there were from my aunts all the way to my newborn cousins. And seeing the attitude of the people in Colombia and how they got together in regards to a community, you could see people saying hi to each other when they passed uh, by each other on the streets. And I started realizing that there was no real issue of threat, there was no games, there was really nothing. And, you know, a teenager over there was a kid. He didn't know anything to do with anything that I'd experienced. So, alhamdulillah, when I realized that um, there was a good environment for me to be able to develop myself, I became an English teacher at the age of 16. And I was teaching from kids in Montessori school all the way to retired professionals. And that, that gave me a great experience because I dealt with people from all different walks just because I knew English. And I, I would make in one hour what a minimum wage worker made in eight hours over there. And I was 16 years old. I became very independent. I bought myself a motorcycle. And um, living in Colombia at that age, being able to go up a mountain and be in a natural spring river by myself and eat fruits from trees. That was something I could have never imagined, living in, in a place that was nothing but concrete, the concrete streets. So I became very kind of inclined to nature, natural. In school, alhamdulillah, in a private school, out of like 60 students in my class, I was second in class or first in class. So education was at its best level. They wanted to drop me two grades because the education here in America was below standard in Colombia. And after I lived that for about two years, I never wanted to come back to America. My parents told me to come back because I was already ready. I changed my ways and so on. When I came back, the same way I mentioned when I got here in third grade and I felt like I had a culture shock, coming back when I was 18 years old, I felt like I didn't want to go out anywhere. For six months, I wouldn't go anywhere. Because I had a feeling like the youth here, even in college now that I was in college, didn't really have the true meaning of what life was about. I felt like the nature and the simplicity and how the people were living in Colombia was the way to live. It didn't have to deal with materialism. It had to deal with family values. It had to deal with respect to elders. A lot of different things that were missing here from what I saw growing up. Eventually, when I was in college, 
little by little people started asking me to go here and go there. And usually a college student is just asked to go to places where there's drinks, where there's, where there's girls, where there's this, where there's that. And little by little, even though I didn't want to, I started falling back into the same environment, which is just the makeup of living here in America, just as a regular person. You go out, you socialize and so on. Um, eventually, I fell into another stage of life, which was about getting money. So at a very young age, 19, 20 years old, I had a Land Cruiser, I had an Acura Legend, I had a very high top paying job, and I was on my way to just drop in college because there was a chain, uh, I'm pretty sure you guys had it before here, Circuit City, there was a, uh, you know, uh, electronic store basically, and they paid commission, and I was the number one salesperson basically in the city of Houston out of like 420 something people. And at the age of 19, 20, I would make sometimes even $5,000 a month. And as a youth, just having cars and living that fast life, other things started kicking in. Being Colombian, the issue of drugs is very simple, it's very easy. People just bring something through and they say, this is just what it is. So eventually, I realized that I didn't want to live that lifestyle and I was fed up. No matter how many things I had, no matter how many friends, supposedly friends, because in that lifestyle, you don't really have true friends. No matter how much I had around me, I would sit back and think, there has to be something else to life. This can't be it. Because if this was it, then I'd be happy and satisfied. But I'm not. So eventually, I went back, I remember telling my father, I was sick of living. And I was tired and fed up and, and I couldn't figure this out. And uh, he told me that he'd been searching for something greater than this life for a while. And I'd seen him coming in and out of different religions. And all my life, he always taught me since I was little, there's only one God. I never prayed to Jesus in my life. My parents, even though they would categorize themselves as Catholics, my father had questioned the issue of the Bible many years. And he would always tell me, you find your truth because I'm seeking for mine. And there's, there's only one reality really is that there's one God. How you get to that one God, you find your way, I'm trying to look for mine. So I remember I went to him and I told him, I'm sick of living, I'm sick of this and that. And I had my own apartment and I was, I was thinking I need to go back to school and I need to get right. And I felt like I want to leave back to Colombia. I didn't really know. I was at a crossroad. And subhanAllah, one day I told him, I said, I want to start reading about different religions. And my father started giving me books about different religions. I remember studying Kabbalah. There was a a Mexican guy who went and studied actually in Israel and Kabbalah is ancient Jewish mysticism and I began to get interested in that there was a woman at that time, she was Colombian a person who I knew since I was 12 years old she seen me go through everything and now she was also seeking for something and we were together in this I remember going into Buddhist temples and sitting down with the main monk and asking him what do you think about life? what's life about? I remember going to the Hindu temple in the middle of their service and sitting and, and saying, who is the main person here? Him, you know, some individual. What does this all mean? And what do y'all think about life? I remember going to different churches and asking about the same verses in the Bible and getting different responses. And nobody could really pin down what things really meant. And so I started feeling as if this is not the way to go. I started looking into Zen masters, which is like a, a Eastern philosophy from, from the Chinese thought. I started reading all kinds of stuff. And eventually, one day after I left the club, I was with a guy who I'd been knowing for years. And he held the liquor he was drinking in his hand and he said, I can't believe I'm still drinking this. I said, what do you mean? Because I've always known him to be that way. And he said, I can't believe I'm still drinking this after having gone to Mecca. When he said that, I felt the level of concern was different. Something about him feeling guilty would intrigue me. I said, what is Mecca? He said, Mecca is where the house of God is. I said, hold on, you know, I, I, I read on religions and philosophies. There is no religion I've ever come across that says that God has a house on the face of the earth. And he said, no, no, no. This place is a place of worship. It was built by Abraham and Ismail. I said, those are prophets of God. And he said, yeah. 
Islam is the true religion of God. That simple statement was so clear and it rang true. Even though I didn't know, but it was direct. Islam is the true religion of God. Then I said, listen, everybody says their religion is true. And he said, look, if you want to talk about this, I'm not the person, right? Because he's not living it. He said, you have to talk to my mother who used to be a Christian nun in Italy. And after leaving the convent later on and marrying my dad, she accepted Islam. She talks to people nowadays that have a doctorate degree in divinity and they have become Muslim. And many people are becoming Muslim. I had no clue what all that was. I went on with life and I kept partying and going out. And in the back of my mind, I would think that's something I got to look into. And subhanAllah, even though we kept living life and we kept going out and everything, every once in a while, he'd just be like, have you looked into it? No, no, not really. And he would say, you know, you got a responsibility now, man. You have to at least look into it. And it, it would just hit me. I mean, this would be like sporadic every three, six months that he would say something like this. And eventually, I remember wanting to go and speak to his mom and I was intoxicated and I went to his house. And he said, man, you can't talk to my mom like that, man. You got to come here clean. You can't come drinking stuff, you know what I mean? I said, okay. So one day I came clean. I remember his mother come in and she was covered. And I remember extending my hand, how you doing, ma'am? She said, hi. <laughs> she didn't shake my hand. I said, uh oh, she don't like me. I've been hanging around with her son all, <laughs> all these years. She knows what we're about, right? So, it's interesting because she said, you want to know about Islam? And she was very happy. Did you, did you want to know about Islam? I said, well, I guess, you know, I just read all kinds of things. And she said, let me ask you this. Do you like science? Do you like mathematics? When she asked me this, I didn't know what that had to do with religion at all. Because we, we don't make the relationship. But Alhamdulillah, because I studied trigonometry and physics in Colombia, I gained an appreciation for the science. And I said, yeah, I mean, I was, you know, yeah. And she said, I want you to see this video. And she put me in a room and she turned this video on from Jamal, uh, Jamal Badawi. Um, and it was the Quran and modern science. When I sat there, I was like, God, this guy's smart, man. God, he speaks so articulate, you know. He has good manners. I could see a lot of different things. And when hearing about the whole issue of how the embryo is formed in the womb of the mother and, and, and certain things about the solar system and, and the, the seas not being mixed, not mixing. So many things I was, I was shocked, but at the same time I didn't understand much of what that had to do with God other than the fact that He created this which I already believed. And she gave me a Quran, Alhamdulillah, and I began to research and read the Quran. I remember going and studying computer programming. And computer programming is nothing but code. And I remember having a hard time sometimes with coding. And I remember the only thing that would clean my mind and get me thinking clearly again was when I picked up the Quran and would read for like two or three minutes. And I would come back and open and everything would be clear. I said, there's something about this book. Eventually, as I kept going out, partying and all these sort of things, we got in a big fight with a whole bunch of uh, security guards outside of a club. It was like 20 against 20. And I was on top of a guy hitting him and a policeman came behind me and with a flashlight made out of iron, he broke my head open. He fled the scene. I couldn't even get a badge number. It was police brutality. I tried to sue. <laughs> but um, things just weren't right. I knew, I knew I had to get my life straight. And then when I was thinking about embracing Islam and really feeling like I really liked it, I wanted to go to a mosque. So I went to a mosque and Alhamdulillah, the people, I saw the good in them when I went in. They weren't judging me, they weren't looking me up and down, who are you, where do you come from, what are you about? And they, they were just very cordial, you know, how can we help you, please sit here, what do you need and so on. And I began to ask questions. And over a period of like one year, I would go back and forth with this one Imam, almost like debating with him. Like what you're telling me right now doesn't make sense because X, Y, and Z. 
right? And he'd be like, well, look into this and look into that, and you may consider this, may consider that. So I would run back, research whatever he said, then come back. Almost like a year, going back and forth. In the midst of thinking like, you know, I'm just going to keep going on with my life. I flipped over on my car doing like 130 on the freeway. I flipped over and my sunroof was open. So when the sunroof was open, it ended up being on the concrete. So a lot of the sparks that were coming out and the sunroof being right there, if my head would have gone there, I'd be finished. Done because the, the whole car smashed. I, without thinking, put my elbow down and I flipped myself and stood on one hand and then grabbed my other friend's head as it was about to go in that hole. As we were sliding 130 miles per hour down the freeway upside down. I remember looking like, I, I was just saying, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, all the way until it stopped. And when it stopped, I remember looking out through the back rear window and I saw like this bright light and all these boots of people coming to the car. And I said, this is it, I'm finished. <laughs> I thought I'm done, I'm, you know, I'm dead, right? You see the sort of things in the movies, like someone, subhanAllah, the bright light was from the construction that was being done on the freeway, like that big bright light, and the boots were from the construction workers. <laughs> I felt like I, I lost my life. But subhanAllah, when, when I crawled out the back, and I saw that I, would, I just had a big scrape, and, and that was it, I even came out without a shoe. I realized right then and there, I, I have to get right with God because I'm going to die. I felt like I was going to die very soon. And it was, it's too many signs, too quick, and it was happening. And so I remember being at a, at a graduation in the masjid when um, some people graduated from studying Arabic or something. And I was there and I was looking at the environment and so on. And uh, I had to have my run-ins with some certain Muslims like before. I, I think I was going to embrace Islam before, like six months before, but I was in the masjid and I remember praying, making the salat and feeling like, you know, I want to see what this is about. And I remember a Muslim who had been seeing me, studying it, he came up to me, he said, so did you embrace Islam? And I said, well, not, not yet. And he said, well, why are you praying? I said, I, I just, I want to pray. <laughs> you know, and he was like, but you, you know, if you don't embrace Islam, you're going to hell. I said, what? I said, you don't even know me, man. That set me back like six months because of the, you know, the, the, the attitude. I, I felt like, and in certain things that I would see from Muslims, I would ascribe that to Islam and I would think, if this is a true religion, that individual wouldn't be doing this. If that was a true, I remember a guy smoking a cigarette in front of me trying to tell me about Islam. I said, tell me where it says that in the book, because I've been reading this book. And he turned the cigarette off and said, man, if you become Muslim, you'll be a better Muslim than me. God. You know, and that to me was too contradictory. And I said, it can't be the truth, because if it were the truth, people wouldn't be acting like this. And that, would, that set me back. I was studying Islam, like trying to find out where all this stuff was, and I couldn't find it. But alhamdulillah, eventually after all these setbacks and, and, and things that were happening to me, I went and I remember a guy told me, uh, you know, so you haven't embraced Islam? I said, no. And he said, you know, we're going to a trip to Florida. And it only costs like $80, and we're going to be there for three days in the middle of like 3,000 Muslims. I said, really? And you know, I love, I love traveling. And uh, he said, yeah, you want to come? And I said, yeah, why not? And I was the only non-Muslim. We rode a bus, we rode, it was three buses. And we left from a mosque and I was the only non-Muslim. And I remember every Muslim wanting to come and give me shahada. Every one of them wanting to come and tell me about not to pray to Jesus. And I would never pray to Jesus. And I couldn't understand why people kept coming. And I kept saying, listen, in the Quran it says that there's no compulsion in religion, right? Don't come impress me. It's whenever I want to. Oh, my brother, listen, listen I've been told I'm going to go to the hellfire. <laughs> you understand? I have my situation with God and that's how I want to keep it, right? SubhanAllah, this gathering in Tampa, Florida, an individual brought another individual by the arm and this guy was literally crying. And he said, this guy here, is going to talk to you. Oh, and he was just crying. And he said, this guy's from Colombia. Because <laughs> he knew I was from Colombia. He said, this is the guy that's going to get you, right? <laughs> and so, I said, okay. And the guy had a long beard and so on, and he's from Colombia. And we sat, subhanAllah, and we talked for like three hours. And the, the majority of the time, 
we were talking about Colombia and he loved the country, I love the country, we know there's a lot of setbacks and I was coming up with so many different things that I found within Islam that if Colombia is a country were to implement, it would be a solution for the country. And then he looked at me and he said, you're telling me you're going to give me solutions for a country and you don't embrace this? That's where I had to, you know, I just, I looked inside my heart and I said, man, I can't keep living like this. So I said, alright, I just don't see how a few words can do something, you know, that is, I mean, anybody can just say a few words, you know. I already believe that there's nothing worthy of worship except when God and Muhammad is messenger. I know that that's the way a person says they're Muslim, but I don't want to claim to be a Muslim. And then there are certain Muslims that are doing certain things that I feel are like hypocritical. I grew up with certain people around me doing certain things and they categorize themselves as a Muslim. If I become a Muslim, I may be put in a category where I'm looked at as a hypocrite. He said, man, it's not about that. Man. It's about saying these words because it's a key to enter paradise. I said, well, I need a better place than this, man, because I'm not happy here. I said, all right. We started walking. It's so funny because the one guy that was like teaching in that masjid, when he told him I wanted to embrace Islam, he got so kind of nervous. Like, oh, just give him, give him shahada over there. He didn't want to do it in front of the people, and I couldn't understand why. I was like... And I said, do I have to do it in front of the people? And the brother was like, no, no, man, but it's good, it's good. And the guy was like, no, I don't know what it was. And then some other brother that was on the bus with us, when he heard, he came all the way to the front. He said, come here, brother. And he grabbed the microphone. And when I said the shahada, Allah's my witness is as if all this weight came off. And then it was like, as if I could hear better, see better. And I felt so light. And I felt like everything made sense. And then all these strangers lined up, dressed like in pajamas, and you know, from different colors and speaking different languages and chewing on a little stick, you know. And, and these people just came, hugged me, some would cry, give me, uh, you know, little bottles of oil and, and you know, little, little stones to, you know. It, I mean, I, I, we never, and you understand what we come from a bit. I never had all these men hug me crying and kiss me. That, that doesn't happen out here growing up, right? And all I knew is that it, w it was love and it was, it was okay because uh, I, it, I felt something. If, they, if I felt something, they felt something. When I walked outside of the masjid, I remember looking at the sky and of course the, the weather in, in Florida is beautiful. And the sky was bluer than usual. The, the, the green and the, and the leaves were just bright. And the one thing that I wanted to do is, is call my mother and tell her, to, tell her, thank you for even having me. That's the level of thankfulness. I never felt that in my life. And I knew the sort of difficulty I put my parents through because I'm the only child. They suffered. And after that day I said, if this makes me feel like this, I never need another intoxicant in my life. Because you take intoxicants because you are empty. When I got back, my parents saw that I wasn't going out. I wasn't taking the calls from my friends. The girls would call and I'd, I just didn't want to deal with anything. And they were like, you left on this trip and came back brainwashed. You're so peaceful, it's scary. What's wrong with you? What did they tell you? What did they do? You know, like I, I joined some cult or something. And they knew I was looking into all kinds of stuff. So they were like, we don't know if he's spinning. I mean, he may be going crazy or something. And I was like, you know, all my life you've been telling me, you know, why do, I, you know, why do you always have to go out? Why do you have to be drinking? Why do you have to be staying out late? And now I'm not doing that and now I'm crazy. That's weird. I don't understand that. Alhamdulillah, my father, because he'd been searching, I told him, what I found is worthwhile that you look into it. Three months later, he accepted Islam. My girlfriend, when I get, came back, she knew she wasn't my girlfriend. Because she was also looking into Islam. And she knew a Muslim, if he's serious, or she's serious, they marry. They don't play all these games. And as soon as I got back, she looked at me and she said, I respect what you did, you know. 
And a, a week later, she accepted Islam. And a month later, we got married. Alhamdulillah. <clears throat> Some of the gang rivals, people that I really, I mean, we were out to kill each other. Some of them have accepted Islam. Some of my friends that were in the gang, one of my best friends that I knew a certain night when there was an attempt on my life, if he would have been there, he would have shot somebody. Because I personally shot, Alhamdulillah, I didn't hit someone. But he would have shot and there may have been some, some casualties. He accepted Islam. He has five kids now. He's a Muslim. People like my little brother-in-law at the age of 16 embraced Islam. My mother-in-law embraced Islam. My wife's aunt, before dying from cancer, embraced Islam. My mother embraced Islam. And on and on and on. I've seen, alhamdulillah, many people embrace Islam. My cousin just embraced Islam about, about a month ago. I went to Colombia to visit for the first time with my daughters. I have a four and a half year old daughter and a two year old daughter. I went back to visit in Colombia. And just in our visit to our family members, 14 people accepted Islam. And some other friends and people that we knew. The project, Islam in Spanish, that was briefly touched upon. Inshallah, I, I, I recommend that you guys come out tomorrow. I believe it's after 1 o'clock, from 1 to 5. 1.30 1 to 5.30. To 4.30, okay, we have a uh, da'wah workshop. And don't think it's an academic, uh, you know, approach to da'wah. It is a very simple approach to da'wah based on what we experienced. Because we went through a trial and error to get where we're at. It's not easy for people to accept Islam, find their place in the Muslim community, alhamdulillah, be able to go overseas. I was blessed with the ability to have gone, alhamdulillah, and studied uh, in Egypt especially the Arabic language, the Qur'an. It, after going through all of this and dealing with people on the ground, our family members, after September 11th, Brother Isa and myself were put in front of the cameras. You know, I embraced Islam three months before September 11th. I remember three months later as a new Muslim standing in front of a church, in a church, 500 people congregating and telling them about Islam. The sort of response that happened after September 11th made my development quick. Dealing with people of knowledge, alhamdulillah, and being able to ask questions. And all of that has led to a lot of trial and error. And we realize, especially with the Latino community, it's the last frontier, it's the last people to actually get this message of Islam. Due to the, uh, the issue of language, we came up, alhamdulillah, with a solution. And we started making audiovisual material. And our material has gone all over the world now. Our website is the number one website with audiovisual material with over 300 audios, more than 300 videos. We have a television show in Houston on a weekly basis. We have an online radio station. And all of this, you'll hear more in detail of why it happened, but really it happened because of my dad. He pressed me to make that material because he said, how can Islam be universal and there's nothing in Spanish? How could the Muslims have lived in Spain 800 years and there's no books left? And his whole challenging, and due to the fact that I studied multimedia, he said, if nobody else did it, then you have to do it. And alhamdulillah, we've done it together, we've worked. And in fact, my father, we use his voice. He's the narrator for a lot of these audio books that we make. Alhamdulillah, Brother Isa just joined us in this project, and now we're on our way to opening up a center called Andalusia, Social and Educational Media Center. And we hope, inshallah, at the end of tomorrow's uh, series of talks in regards to Da'wah, but really what do non-Muslims really think and experience and what do new Muslims really think and experience? Then we'll finalize with why this project came about, what sort of, alhamdulillah, things have happened and, and, and where things are going so far. And uh, inshallah, we, we appreciate your time. And uh, inshallah, I guess if you guys have any questions, if there is time, inshallah, we can address them. Jazakumullah khair. As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah.